Jesus more. We'll be moving into that study. Um, he is the president of Wheaton College, where Sandy Richter uh, teaches. And so if you've been a part of any of those studies with Sandy Richter, um, they've been amazing. And that book is no less amazing. It's an easy read. Uh, I think you'll get through it in a short amount of time. Um, but we'll, we'll go through. We won't do, we won't do uh, every chapter as a study because that will that'll take a long time to get through. So we'll do you know, a couple of the chapters we'll do individually and then uh, some of them will combine into one study. So um, just a really good really, really good book. It really convicted my heart about how I love Jesus and how that is displayed through my life. Um, so that will be two weeks, well, not this one, say, next one, say, week and a half. Got a week and a half to do some reading and kind of get ahead. Get ready. Get ready. Yes, it's going to be awesome. Um, Prayer time Monday morning, uh, Wednesday morning, and Friday morning, 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. Uh, the doors will be open if you would like to come and uh, just spend some time with the Lord. And uh, before I got COVID, we uh, we were going to have um, Pastor. Dave Limmer come and speak with us, and so from Casper, um, he was actually supposed to come that week that I was down and out, and that we had so many people down and out, and we didn't end up having service that week, uh, but we will um, work on getting him back probably in February, so he'll come back and share with us just a really um, amazing man, and he preaches a good word, so just want to, he, he started Restoration Church up in Casper, um, his son Justin Limmer is now the pastor, but uh, Dave still travels around and speaks and shares, and so we'll have him down here probably in February to share with us. We love to use her. Yes. so <laughs> sad. Um, and then uh, I think we've got on, on track later this year in July, I think we'll have uh, Dennis Ramirez come back and uh, he'll share with us on a Sunday in July. So we'll keep you informed as that gets closer. Um, yeah, so that's about all I got. So getting back on track of where we're at and what's happening, um, I... Listen to a message, I want to make sure you get credit where credit is due, I listened to a message this week by a man named Douglas Wilson, 1L Wilson, not any relation to Joy or the family, um, but he is a theologian, he ministers at a church in Moscow, Iowa, I think, um, I think it's Iowa, that's where that's at, um, but he preached a message that just really resonated with me and took a lot out of it. Um, so I'm going to be sharing today some of uh, that and, uh, of course, making it making it our own. Um, you know, his theology is a little bit different, so there were a few things that, you know, you just, okay, but... For the most part, a lot of what he shared was really, I believe, right on point and right on track. Um, so we're going to start a series, and the series is going to be titled The Weapons of Our Warfare. And I think Greg and I, Pastor Greg and I, are going to tag team this one and bounce back and forth, and that might even mean alternating Sundays every other Sunday we swap through the midst of the series, he just got the, oh man, look, <laughs> you can go, brother, you can do it. Um, but there's just so much uh, that was shared in the message that really needs to be taken apart, really needs to be unpacked and looked at. The importance
importance of this, I believe, is as we're moving forward in the times in which we live, um, you know, we often we often understand that this is a spiritual battle that that, that we're in. That's not a that's not a news flash to us, but sometimes it can be difficult to wrap our heads around what really the weapons of our warfare really are. I mean, what do we really have and what can we really use as believers? I mean, we know that prayer is probably the greatest weapon, the greatest resource that we have in the midst of spiritual warfare, um, but we don't really grasp, I think, sometimes the, the different things that we as believers not only uh, can do on a spiritual level, but even on a physical, practical level. You know, how, how, do, we, how do we fight this battle in a practical sense? I mean, because if we can't wrap our head around it in everyday application, then it becomes some distant thing that, yeah, okay, we believe, and yeah, but I guess I just pray, and we just kind of lift up whatever, and then it is what it is. Um, so we're going to look at a lot of this as we go through. Today's message is kind of going to be the introductory to this series, and it's going to really highlight everything that we're going to go through in this series and, and just kind of be the intro in, in all of these uh, different messages that will come through this series. But if you have your Bibles, it turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to read verses uh, 3 through 5. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 3, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalt, exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. When we read this, the, the first, some of the things that really point out to us in this, um, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not walk according to the flesh in verse 3. The reality is that, you know, and, and we see some scriptures that we can kind of start thinking maybe there's, it sounds kind of contradictory, right? I mean, Paul says in Romans that, you know, don't walk by the flesh, but walk by the spirit. And now here he's saying, you know, well, we walk in the flesh, but, you know, we, 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 don't, um, we don't war according to the flesh. And so just bringing our minds into a realization that, you know, we really are, um, as much as we are spiritual beings, we are fleshly beings too. We have a fleshly body, right? We have tangible hands and arms and legs and feet and you know, some more than others through life experiences, but, um, <laughs> we, you know, things happen, right? But for the most part, we're still, <laughs> for, the, for the most part, we're still fleshly, you know, we, we have a fleshly body. And so our, our life in this moment, even though our life is eternal, our life is still very much um, present in, in a mortal uh, container. Yes. And so as we walk through this life, um, we, we understand that this is where we're at. You know, I've heard, I've heard some people say, well, you know, so-and-so, they're just so spiritually minded, they're no earthly good. Mm -hmm. And, and there's, there's a place where that's kind of a reality, where that becomes true. When you get so wrapped up in, you know, always, I mean, you're checked out, really, right? You're, you just, oh, everything is so, it's just, I'm in my spiritual bubble, I'm in my spiritual realm, I'm in my, and sometimes those individuals have a hard time fulfilling their responsibilities. They have a hard time uh, with work. Sometimes they have a hard time with just relating with other people. Yeah, I mean... Because they're so, they're so checked out of this reality 
that they're no good to this reality. And that's a reality. <laughs> um, so we, we, we want to understand that, yes, there is a spiritual battle, and some of the tendency could be in this moment to try to get ourselves so spiritually minded in this spiritual battle that we're not fulfilling our daily responsibilities and, and requirements that are on our life and, and actually functioning in a manner that is consistent with the kingdom of God. I mean, the, 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 the whole understanding that we need to come to is that we are in this earth, we are in this present time, we are in this present reality, and this is a reality, and, and we do live and move and breathe, and the desire of God is not for the kingdom citizens to check out from this reality and step into the other, but it's to bring the other reality into this reality. We got to bring the spiritual reality into the physical reality. That's the power that God has given his children to manifest the kingdom of God on this earth. And so the re this, this understanding then comes to play with uh, bringing ourselves to the point where we start to ask the question, how do we really do that? How do we really bring the kingdom of God into this earth? If the kingdom of God is a spiritual reality that we know, that we're acquainted with, that we understand, how do we manifest that in this reality? How do we do that? What, is the, what are the practical steps that we can accomplish that? And, and ultimately what we will see is that those very things are the weapons of our warfare. Because the more that we are bringing the kingdom of God into this earth, the greater we are fighting this battle, yes. and the more advancement and ground is being taken. Yes, amen. So we, we really need to come to this place where we're wrapping our brains around this. Um, no, verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty. I... When I see this, I understand that one of the things that Paul is doing is he's, he's setting this, this uh, opposition of, of ideas. So, so he's, he is comparing carnal to mighty. Okay? The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. Um, so... <clears throat> When we look at this, one of the things that, that we have to do is we have to really grasp what carnal really means. All right? I mean, we've heard messages and we've heard carnal Christians, you know, and carnal believers and, you know, all of that. But what does that really mean? And what that really means is that um, we're basically, the understanding of carnal is that you're living your life in a manner that is uh, pleasing, appeasing, and comforting your fleshly desires. So it's, it's basically living life in a manner that, that is comfortable for my flesh. And that, you know, one of, the, one of the root definitions and understanding here in carnal actually um, is defined in the Greek here as animal tendencies. So you're entertaining these animalistic desires and feelings. And it doesn't just go with sexual immorality, right? I mean, we, we do this in a lot of ways. We do it financially. Yeah. We do it with um, the, the individuals that we surround ourselves with. We do it with the things we watch on TV. We do it with um, how we interact with our family, how we interact with the world around us. Um, you know, if you find yourself in work in a moment where you see a prime opportunity to uh, share the gospel of Jesus and you pull back because you don't want the discomfort, you don't want the possible reaction of, well, oh, they're weird or you know, the possible persecution that may be associated with it, and that that is going to become more of a reality in the days that we move forward. That's right. 
every time we do that, we are, we are succumbing to this thing where the flesh is uncomfortable and I don't want to be in that position. So I'm going to draw back or I'm going to do things that help keep my flesh comfortable. So they're not carnal, but they're mighty. That word mighty actually understood in the Greek is a, a defining as um, powerful to do something, powerful to accomplish something. Um, so if we're looking at this in the, in, in the realm of how do we bring the kingdom of God to this earth as opposed to you know, just being checked out and in the kingdom of God mentally or spiritually or whatever. And, and how do we make advancements in this? Paul is saying here, you're not going to do it as long as you are keeping your flesh comfortable. Amen. As long as your focus is on no pain, no discomfort, no frustration, no, you know, none of that. If that's your focus, you're not going to wage this war. Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll be an ineffective individual in the battle. You'll be on the sidelines watching everybody else fight, wishing maybe that you could get into the fight, but refusing to get into the fight because the power of your flesh is stronger than your spiritual position. For pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, all of this talk, all of this language is, is when, when we look at this in the Greek and understand the true definitions, the, the language here is that you're pulling down these, these fortified barriers and walls that have been raised and exalted against God. See, a lot of times we read through this section of scripture, we just take this on a personal level. And there is personal application. We want to cast down all of our thoughts. We want to pull down all of the imaginations in our mind that would exalt itself against God. Yes, we want to do that. But Paul is not solely focused on the personal aspect of this. Paul's desire, and if you look at his ministry, his desire throughout his ministry was that not only personally, but regionally and locally and nationally and globally, every high thing that exalted itself against God would be pulled down. That he, through the power of God advancing the kingdom of God, his focus was to bring every thought that was against God into captivity everywhere he went. We saw this with his interaction with the people of Ephesus. He comes to Ephesus and he sees this, this, this temple and this thing built to the unknown God. So then he makes this, this audacious claim that, look, the unknown God has a name. I mean, he just steps right in and preaches this powerhouse message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, confronts the imaginations that are exalted against God and tears them down and causes a revival in Ephesus that lasts over a hundred years. This was Paul's focus. Every high thing. Every high thing. How do we do that? Sometimes you just need to speak up. Yeah. Look, because there are, there are imaginations and there are high things that are being not only thought of in the minds of individuals, but they're being freely spoken out yes. yeah. as truth. Right. And sometimes the only way to pull those down is to step in with a word of truth. Yeah. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity, every thought personally, every thought locally, every thought regionally, every thought nationally, and every thought globally that exalts itself against God. Amen. So how do we do that? There are several 
weapons at our disposal. And these weapons are practical. They're actually how we live our lives out. The first one, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, and verse 28. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, it says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. This weapon that is being alluded to here is really worship. Jesus said that God was a spirit. Those who worship him have to worship him in spirit and in truth. Right? And worship is one of our biggest weapons in this battle because worship is our place of actually coming into the presence of God and honoring and exalting God for who he is and what he is and because he is. See, so when, when the body of Christ, when the believers come into this place where you have a situation that barriers, ideas, imaginations, and all of these things have been, have been elevated and lifted up against the knowledge of God and against who God is and against what God is and against the very fact that God even is, then how do we fight that? One of the biggest ways we fight that is by coming together, coming together, and, and lifting up the truth of who God is Amen. so that the kingdom of God becomes elevated higher Amen. Amen. than the barriers and the imaginations and the thoughts of the world. Amen. And when we come together and we elevate God higher and we speak out of the truth of the word of God and we worship him Amen. for who he is, it is a declaration in this reality yes. of, the, of the kingship of yes. God in the kingdom of God. And so in that moment, we are effectively manifesting the kingdom of God. What is happening in the heavens? What is happening around his throne all the time? Worship and holy, holy, holy is God. And we bring that from the kingdom of God into this earth. And we participate in that. That is one of the greatest weapons that we have as believers. Amen. Number two. I'm going to have to look this up real quick because I did not get this. Give me one second. Proverbs 28, 13. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. In the advancement of the kingdom of God on this earth, we as believers have to come before God and just be very honest yeah. about our sin. Yeah. And we have to say, God, this is where I've missed it. This is where I've done wrong. This is where I've failed. And to keep the short accounts with God, yeah. The, the thing that we're going to be seeing here as we move 
forward is we're going to see the Um, we're going to see troubles and trials increase. Okay? The amplification of troubles and trials in this nation. We're going to see that. We're, we're going to see it. It's a reality. For however long <laughs> the executive orders and the pens are moving as fast as he can write, we're going to see the amplification of troubles and trials in this nation. We're going to see it not only nationally, but we're going to see it regionally, and we're going to see it locally. And we're going to see it personally. And all of these things are going to hit us in different ways. And if we're not, if we're being held back because we're not clean with God, then how in the world can we assume to advance the kingdom of God beyond our own personal life? You're not. You're not. If you can't do it, look, if you can't advance the kingdom of God even in your own personal life, how are you going to do it on even a local, regional, let alone national level. It's not going to happen. So, then the weapon of our warfare becomes our honesty before God. It becomes how quick we are to repent. It becomes how how able we are to maintain a clean life. It doesn't mean that we don't get it wrong. It doesn't mean that we don't fail. It doesn't mean that we're not going to. But we become quicker in our response time. Because you're not going to be able to afford having the lag from the blessing of God. The third weapon of our warfare Ecclesiastes 9 9. Cold blooded book, man. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 9 says, Live joyfully with the wife whom you love all the days of your, or with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life which he has given you under the sun all your days of vanity, for that is your portion in life and the labor in which you perform under the sun. This, live joyfully with your spouses. You, I mean, who would have thought that, that actually loving your spouse and having a good relationship would be a weapon of our warfare? Oh, it's a huge weapon. We, the very idea of marriage is crumbling in this nation. The very idea of the sanctity of marriage is crumbling. The idea that marriage is between a man and a wife is on its way out the door. Again, another imagination that has exalted itself against God. How do we fight that? By exalting a truth of the Word of yes. God. Yes. By living out and exemplifying a good, passionate, powerful marriage. And then people step back and they look at our marriages and they say, Wow, that's different. That's not what we're hearing through the media. That's not what we're hearing through the narrative that is being pushed upon us in this nation. I can look at you and see your marriage and see the enjoyment that you have in each other, see how much you love each other, see how much you care for each other, 
And wow, it's, it's a weapon in our warfare. It's fighting the battle. See, all of these things, when we look at the things and the narrative that's being pushed upon us, we're looking at it and we're saying, what is the antithesis of that? <laughs> because all of this is, a, is an exaltation of imaginations that are totally yes. opposite yes. to the kingdom of God. Yes. Yes. So what is the antithesis of homosexual marriage? What is the antithesis of of you don't have to be married, you can have just kids and just bounce around between different partners and it's okay and whatever and hey, you know what, when you're tired of having kids you can go to the abortion clinic and just get rid of them and you don't have to worry about anything that you... What is the antithesis of that? What is the opposite of that? The opposite of that is two people who have come into a covenant relationship between themselves and God and they love each other and they actually enjoy each other and they share a life that is powerful. Manifesting the kingdom of God on this earth. It's a huge weapon in our warfare. Number four, if you're keeping numbers. Psalm 22, 3. <laughs> Psalm 22, 3. And it says, But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Now, you would think that maybe this is worship, but um, this is more about music. And music isn't, okay, I'm, I'm not talking about, you know, let's, let's get on the train of bashing worldly music, and then let's get on the train of talking about worldly music coming over into the church. That's not what I'm talking about. What we're talking about here is that... Um, you know, when, when the children of Israel went into battle, uh, one specific instance where the worshipers went out in front of the yeah. army, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and there was music that was being played. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there was, in this battle, there was a holy soundtrack yes. <laughs> for the battle that was yeah. waging, right? Yeah. And, and it was through the expression and the production of that music that, that stirred and moved the Spirit of God and He completely wiped out the enemy before the, before the army ever had to get engaged. Yeah. Amen. What is the music of the kingdom? If you want to know what the music of the kingdom is, look, it's read through the book of Psalms. God gave us, God gave us some heavenly soundtracks <laughs> to play on this earth, and no other place in Scripture, no other, no other book in Scripture contains the musical verse that God was uniquely and so amazingly drawn to as the Psalms of David. And these, actually, as we move forward in this season, these have a lot of relevance. I mean, they, they, all throughout history, they've always had relevance. But they become, what you find is that in the times of trial, in the times of testing, in the times of hardship, you find more people turning back to the psalm than during other times. People aren't too concerned with the psalms during times of prosperity, wealth, and blessing. The reason is because they were birthed out of the heart of an individual in the midst of trial and struggle. And there is a attachment spiritually 
that we get with the Psalms during times of trial and struggle because they speak to our heart because they were birthed out of trial and struggle. This is the music. Man, read through the Psalms. Read through the Psalms. Get them in your mind. Get them in your heart. Get them in your... And as you read through them, it becomes a weapon in the midst of warfare. How is this, how is the Psalms a weapon in the midst of our warfare? <clears throat> it's a weapon in the midst of our warfare because it not only gives us a pure and holy channel through which to express our, our problems and our frustrations, but it also brings in it a response to those frustrations so we don't get lost in them, all right? How easy would it have been for David to get lost in the struggle? And he lifts up the struggle that he has. He, he cries it out to God. God doesn't want you to be silent about your struggles. He doesn't want you to be silent about your problems. He's not telling you to stuff it down. Right? right? Yeah. Lift it up to Him. Give it up to Him. And be ready to receive the truth of the answer in response. Yeah. Because if you don't, then that problem and that trial and that struggle will end up turning into an imagination and a thought that would lift itself up against the goodness of God. Yes. So the only way to battle that, the only way to confront that, yes, you lift up, get it out, get out the frustration, get it out. God's big enough. He can handle it, I promise, okay? He knows what you're feeling anyway, so it's not a surprise. So let it come out, but receive the truth Amen. in response. Mm -hmm. Receive the truth in response. Position yourself before God in a way that, that you understand that God is saying, yeah, let it all out. Come on, give me, give me everything. Give me all of your frustrations. Come on, give them. Come on, get them out, get them out, get them out. But understand that, it, that you need to you need to come into the same position before God that he just took before you. Whereas once you get them out, now you say, okay, God, give me the truth. Give me the truth. Give me the answer. Give me the truth. Give me the response. Help me to see the alternative of this. Help me to see the reality of your kingdom, not the reality of my situation. Yeah. Hospitality, Romans chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. Romans 12, starting in verse 12, rejoicing in the hope patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. One of the things that um, becomes really easy in the midst of struggles is to just become a hermit. I, in the midst of trials, um, I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to deal with anybody. I don't want to communicate with anybody. I just want to hold up in my thing. Well, how is that advancing the kingdom of God? See, because the trials and the struggles are actually a thought and an imagination that has lifted itself up against God. So if you retreat under those trials and tribulations then you're not effectively taking those things that have been elevated against the knowledge of God into captivity. You're basically giving them power. You're saying, it's true. You're saying, that's the reality. You're saying, the kingdom of God has no power over that reality. And the only thing that I can do in this season is just retreat. God never called you to retreat. In, in the army of God, you've got nothing to cover your backside. Okay? So when you turn around, you're exposed. And when you turn around, you can get beat up and you can actually get killed. 
Jesus said that, that we're, we're not, you know, any man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. No, we we got to put our hands on the plow. Come on, we're going through this rocky ground. Okay, We're going to plow through this fallow ground in order to plant seeds of truth in the kingdom of God so that they will sprout and grow and manifest the kingdom. That's the season we're in. The hands have been put to the plow. We're not looking back. We're not turning around. We're not saying, oh God, well, let me go do this first. And we're not saying, oh God, this is too hard. Look at the size of this field. And we've only plowed like two feet into it. We've hit nothing but boulders. I'm done. Forget it. Hospitality becomes a weapon in the midst of this battle because it, it opens up. We open up ourselves and our homes and our lives to others around us who, guess what, are going through the same struggles and trials and problems. And now we as believers who have the truth, who are concerned about taking every thought captive, can then share the truth with others who are going through the same things in those seasons or those moments of hospitality, and we can minister life in the midst of their struggles. Minister life in the midst, look, this, given the hospitality in context here, is in the midst of trials and tribulations. Verse 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. In the midst of tribulation, how do we fight tribulation? What is the weapon for this? Refusing the urge to just step back and just become a hermit and actually stepping forward and opening up and saying, hey, why don't you guys come over tonight? Why don't we do this? Even in the midst of a pandemic. Because the pandemic itself is something that has lifted itself up against the knowledge of God and against the truth of God. And so we can stand against that. And we have a weapon, and that weapon is hospitality, community. You know, this is, we, we, we live in fragmented times. We live in times where the enemy, look, look at what the enemy has tried to do. Yes. Try to separate and isolate. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of the greatest strategies of all time for war is divide and conquer. If you can split them up and you can divide them up and you can start getting smaller groups set out on their own, then they're easier to conquer. So how do we fight that? Come together. Community. Family. Hospitality. Build stronger. Build stronger. Build stronger. And let it grow. And let it grow. Education. Education becomes a, a big weapon in the midst of this warfare because um, if we would have been intent about education, we probably wouldn't be where we're at. Yeah. Because you can't raise a godless generation and not expect at some point in time that generation to come in power and produce a godless culture. So when we, when we don't confront the lies of the education system and we don't stand for truth when they're filling our children's heads full of garbage <coughs> and filling their head full of the things that exalt themselves against God, then we lose a generation. Yeah, it's yeah. lost. So how do we fight that? No point in going back, right? I mean, we can sit here and say, oh, well, we wish we would have all we want. But we're beyond that point. Mm -hmm. So what do we do now? Now we become very intent about educating our children, about educating each other about the truth of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. We bring education of the kingdom into this world, and it may take a little while for this to really have the full impact, but what we'll see is we'll start seeing a reversal 
of the cultural norms. Because you're instituting godly education. And so, if our children are in public schools, we need to be even more intent yes, right. about educating them mm -hmm. on the truth of the word. Right. Do not let the only education your children receive come from that school. That's right. That's right. If they're in that school, do more educating. Yes. Be the stronger voice. Yes. Yeah. Be the louder voice. Yeah. Finances. This has been a hard one for me. I'm not going to lie. Just put it out there. <laughs> I'm not the most financially adept individual that there is. <laughs> but finances become a weapon. Mm -hmm. yeah. They become a weapon for the advancement of the kingdom of God. Yeah, that's true. If we don't have finances, how can we financially support the kingdom of God advancing? The other area where finances becomes a problem, and this is something that um, I am becoming very aware of, is that if you have a lot of debt, yeah. um, those areas of debt become handles that yes, yes. can steer you and force you to move a direction that is not consistent with the kingdom of God. Yes. Now you have pinch points in your life that you have to do certain things because of the debt load. Yes, that's true, that's true. And you can't do certain things because of the debt load. That's true. Freedom in your finances will equate to freedom in the advancement of the kingdom of God. Because nobody in this world can grab hold of you and say, what about this? Now see, I own a piece of you. Yeah, yeah. I own a piece of you. Some of these uh, big churches out there find themselves into big problems because, guess what? The world owns a pretty big piece of them. A really big piece. So now I have to change what I speak. I have to change what I preach to accommodate the masses because if I don't have the masses, then I don't have the finances. And if I don't have the finances, then the ministry goes under See, there's a handhold that's forcing you to be steered in a direction that you should have never been allowed to be steered by. Yeah. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10. chapter 8 and verse 10. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those from whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. It's really easy to step into the place of sorrow for what just happened a week and a half ago. I know it was this week, wasn't it? Wednesday. Wow. Time has gone by. <laughs> it's really easy and, so and, and to step into this place of sorrow. But when you do that, you're, you're admitting defeat. You realize that. When you step into the place of hopelessness, you've admitted defeat. When you allow yourself to be overcome by grief, to be overcome by, by these things that, that the situations of this world bring upon us, and it's not saying that in moments of, of, of serious things there's not a place for true mourning, there's not a place for true sorrow. Godly sorrow is really a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It's true. But we don't get lost in it. We don't get... We don't, Ungodly sorrow is the place where because of the things that have exalted himself against Christ, I have nothing to do but become 
come into this place of, of hopeless desperation. We are not without power. We are not without strength. We are not without weapons of warfare. We are not without the things that we need. God is pretty smart. And God prepared His children. He gave His children everything they needed to succeed in the battles that they would be fighting. And one of the biggest weapons that we have is the joy of the Lord. See, this relates all the way back through some of this. I mean, uh, worship and being honest before God with your sin and um, hospitality and the music and all of this stuff. It, the joy of the Lord as we, as we meditate on the truth of God against the truths that are trying to be put upon us from this world, which are really lies, that are exalting themselves up against the truth. But when we meditate on the kingdom of God and we meditate on the greatness of his power and on the greatness of everything that he has, where is our position to be lost in sorrow? How do we find ourselves in that position? How do we get ourselves out of that position? You've got to meditate on the kingdom of God. You've got to meditate on God. You've got to meditate on the truth. You've got to be bringing in the truth. Look, take those thoughts captive. Amen. Dismantle them. Yep. Drag them down. They have no place of residence within you. Amen. Cheerfulness and laughter is a weapon of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is your strength. <laughs> this pastor shared in this moment, he said, don't be sorrowful for your grandchildren. Don't be sorry for your children and your grandchildren. Oh, this is a horrible world and how can I ever... I mean, oh, I feel so bad for them. I mean, all of the garbage and all of the stuff they're going to have to walk through. Don't feel bad for them. Look, you're training warriors. Why would you train a warrior and then pray for no battles? Douglas Wilson said, why would you train dragon slayers and then pray for a, sea, for a time for no dragons? <laughs> you, don't, you don't do that. You're trained. You're equipped. You were made specifically for this moment. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Don't feel sorry for your children, your grandchildren. You and your children and your grandchildren were purposed and planned for this moment. Amen. For this time. Born for this season. How much joy in the Lord should we have in that? Man, God, you looked out throughout all eternity and you said, you know what? In 2020, I'm going to need a Rick. I'm going to need a EJ. I'm going to need a Greg and an Annette and Alicia and Joy. And I'm going to need Sean and Rhonda and Warren and Brittany. I'm going to need all these people in this season. Wow. Hallelujah. We were made for this. We were made for this. Man. We were not made to cower in the midst of this. We were made to stand strong in the midst of this. Yeah. Our purpose for existing is to advance the kingdom of God. And this was the moment. This was the struggle. This was the battle. This was the war that God chose to have us as soldiers in the army to advance his kingdom. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children and walk uh, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, if you back up to verse 6, and these words which I commanded you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. But one of the things that, that we have to do is when we hear the truth of the word of God, we need to go back home and expound upon it. Yeah. We need to spend some time to unpack it as a family. Yeah. Spend some time. It's like, 
you know, we went to this, we had this great message at church where all this truth was brought forth, where all of this stuff, how do we, how do we grab hold of those messages? How do we grab hold of the truth of the word of God through those things? And we don't just let them slip. Look, we spend enough time in our lives going from Sunday to Sunday to Sunday to Sunday hearing word after word after word after word and it having no effect, no effect, no effect, no effect. How do we change that? How do we, how do we overcome that? How do we get beyond that? What, what is our weapon now? What is our path forward now? Our path forward is, man, take these words that Pastor Greg teaches, that I teach, that EJ teaches. Take this, the Bible studies that we teach. Go back with your families. Unpack it. Dig through it. Man, what did you think about that word? What did you thought? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? What spoke to you about that? Was there something in there that we didn't that you didn't understand? I mean, let's go to the word together and let's open it up and let's see if we can if we can come to some understanding. Dig into it. Dig into it. Douglas Wilson in his message says that, you know, the, the church we, we package this stuff up for you. You know, we take all this word of God and the study and stuff and then we package it up and we give it to you. And then it's your responsibility to go home and unpack it. Go home and, and open it up and see what's in there and, and bring it out. He said the best place to do this is family time around the dinner table. He's like, get back to the dinner table. Eat dinners together. Sit there and talk about the Word of God. Talk about the things you've heard. Talk about the Bible study. Talk about the sermon on Sunday. Talk about what you've been reading in your devotions. Talk about, I mean... See, the way forward in this is not looking back at what we should have done. And what we didn't do. The way forward now. What do we do now? Now we adopt kingdom principles. Now we adopt kingdom lifestyle. And we start to live it out in our homes. We start to live it out amongst the, the, the people that we are surrounded with. And as they see it, they start getting testimony of the truth of the kingdom of God. Which brings them to a place where they finally have questions about it. Which then opens the door for the gospel. Which then gives us the ability to advance the kingdom of God outside of our homes beyond our homes, but it has to start within our homes. It has to start within us personally. We get these things right, we get them put in our homes, and we start moving this out, and eventually what you're going to see is the kingdom of God will take over the kingdom of darkness, and it'll happen at a faster rate than you ever thought possible. Mm -hmm. Good work. How do we change Rollins, Wyoming? We've looked at that map. We've seen that map. How do we impact Rollins? How do we get from Rollins up to Casper and impact Casper? How do we get this thing spread across the state? It starts with us personally, and it starts with us in our homes, and it starts with us advancing the kingdom of God in a very real, tangible way that then becomes a testimony to those who are watching. That's where true advancement comes. You understand, this isn't a two-month vision. This is a lifetime, and possibly multiple lifetimes. But we come through it, we come at it with this understanding that, look, if we don't start planting the seeds now, we can't ever expect to have a tree. We can't expect some of these things to change overnight, but we can expect to start doing the work, and eventually they will change. Study and reading the Word of God. Start getting disciplined in your Bible study. If, if you find yourself in a position where you're completely lost and you have no concept of what God's doing in this moment and, and you're cowering in fear and you're, you're holed up in your home get into the word get into the word study, study read the word, read the word having a couple little plaques up with some scripture verses in your house isn't reading the word
Spurgeon said that some Christian's Bible have enough, enough dust on them that you could take your finger and write the word damnation across it. into the word. Soak in the word. Yes. Do, you, do you understand what went part and parcel with David and his songs? Where the reality of the truth came after pouring out his frustrations, after pouring it. Do you know why after he poured those things out, the truth started to well up inside of him? Because he meditated on the word of God, David. Because he was constantly just the word, just over and over and over in his mind. When you fill yourself so much with the word of God, it doesn't mean you're never going to have frustrations. It doesn't mean you're never going to have problems. It doesn't mean you're never going to be angry about the situation. It doesn't mean you're ever going to find yourself in a position where you're going to be venting to God. But what it does mean is that when you're done with all that, everything that you've been soaking in, Starts to resonate, starts to come up, it starts to, it starts to fill you. It's true. Amen. When you get past all of those things, when you get past all of the frustrations, all of the hurts, all of the they did us wrong, all of the when you get past all of that, the very next thought in your mind is going to be back to the word, back to the word, back to the word. Fill yourself with the word. Fill yourself with the Word. Dig into the Word. Don't just dig into the Word. Read some books. Some good books. I got a whole library back there full of good books. Grab one every now and then. Read it. Cover to cover. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. <laughs> 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 1 Corinthians 3.13 1 Corinthians 3.13 Each one's work will become clear for the day will declare because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Get busy. Do some work. You know one of the things, one of the, one of the best ways to combat um, your mind taking control and running in all kinds of weird ways and thoughts that exalt themselves against God. You know the best way to overcome that sometimes? Just get busy. Do something. Do something. And not just do something. Do something for the kingdom. Amen. Get busy about the kingdom work. Get busy about advancement of the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Dig in to church. Where can I serve? What can I do? What can, what needs to be done? Where do you guys need help? What is there that needs to be? I mean, look, we're 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 in a season where it's it's really all hands on deck. Yes. You know, we don't have time for the for the lazy believer. We don't have time for the comfortable believer. We don't have time for the person who, who just wants to sit in the middle of the storm, hold up in their, in their captain's ready room and just sit there and hope that somebody else is taking care of the ship because I'm too afraid to get out there and do anything about it. We don't have time for that. It's time to get busy. Look, this is a weapon of our warfare as much as anything is. Doing work for the kingdom of God, it puts you in a different mindset. It puts you in a different place. It gives you hope. It gives you purpose. It gives you something to latch hold of. Something to anchor you in the midst of turbulent times. Doing work for the kingdom of God. We're really good at being busy. But is our busy actually accomplishing anything? Is our busy actually doing anything productive? For the kingdom of God. I'm 
really bad at this, man. I see an idea, it's like, boom. <laughs> and I'm running faster, and I look, boom. I'm like, yeah, let's go this way. And I've gotten a lot less busy in the last six months. A lot less busy. It's helped me be a lot more focused about advancing the work that really matters, about doing what God's actually called me to do. Oh, I can do anything. Don't. Stop it. Yes, you can do anything, but don't try to do everything. Good point. Good point. Do what God has called you to do. Know and understand that the verse that says everything is possible isn't talking about you filling your plate with so much stuff and saying it's all possible. Everything is possible means that everything that is needed to accomplish the task for which God has created you and put you on this earth is possible to accomplish that task. Rain in some focus. That was to me. Sorry. <laughs> that, was, that was my part of the message. Joel chapter 1 verse 3. We're almost done. Joel chapter 1 verse 3. Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. Are you living a life that's actually a story worth being told? <laughs> Have some adventures. Let God lead you into some crazy moments where at the end of your life you can sit there with your children and your grandchildren and you can say, man, I remember this one time I stepped out in faith and I was so out of my element. I was surrounded by all of this darkness and there was all this things of the world just like they were coming down on me. But you know what, man? I mean, I just kept believing in God and he showed up in the right moment at the right time and delivered us from that situation. I mean, live your life to where you have some stories to tell. Think of... When, when we think of warriors, and we think of those who have fought battles, what happens at the end of their life? Man, they got some stories. See, if you're not a warrior, if you're not fighting the battles, your stories are going to be pretty, eh. Oh, I remember this one time, I was sitting in the couch and we were out in milk. <laughs> That was a rough day, I'm telling you. But God came through. All right? God came through. <laughs> Those aren't stories warriors tell. Think of if you're fighting the battle, you're going to have stories, and they're going to be stories worth telling. And you may not win every battle. You may not overcome in every situation because we got our thoughts or are distracted or, you know, we took up the wrong weapons. We, we tried to fight carnally instead of spiritually. But if, you, if you've been fighting any battles, you've got stories to tell. And there's a generation that needs to hear the stories. Yeah. They need to hear the stories. It's where they find their strength. It's where they find their motivation. That's where they find their desire to go out and fight the battles too. Yeah. Yeah. The greatest, the greatest fault of our military, the decline of our, our military would be if the generals stopped telling the stories. Because eventually you end up with a generation that wouldn't even go into the military. For what? <clears throat> what for? But when you tell the stories, you inspire. Yes. You inspire.
inspire people. And it's not just for your children, it's not just for your grandchildren. It's for those around you. Because there's people around you that need to be inspired. They need to be inspired to get into the battle. They need to be inspired to fight in the midst of the battle. And they need to be inspired not to give up when the battle looks like it's not going to be yeah. winnable. Tell them your stories. The weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they're very practical. Yeah. The stuff we can do every day, things we can do daily to fight the battle that is before us. We know prayer is a weapon of our warfare. The worship, honesty about sin, marriage, music, hospitality, community, education, finances, <coughs> cheerfulness, laughter, spending time as a family, reading and, and, and unpacking the Word, studying and reading the Word, uh, doing work for the Kingdom of God, and sharing the stories of the battles we've been through. They're all weapons of our warfare. And over the next few weeks, we'll dig into some of these and we'll really expound on some of these because we really need to understand some of the more particular ins and outs on some of these to really get them and really start functioning well with them. We move forward in this season. We have weapons. We have a path forward. We keep fighting. We keep fighting. Taking every thought captive. Our desire should be to take every thought captive. Not just personally, in our families, in our homes, we take every thought captive. In our relationships, we take every thought captive. In our church, we take every thought captive. In our community, we take every thought captive. In our state and in our nation, we take every thought captive. And we cast down every imagination, every high thing. This is our path. This is where we go. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for giving us very real weapons. We thank you, Lord, for giving us powerful weapons, weapons that are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds, weapons that are not carnal, but weapons that actually accomplish the purpose for which you have created them. And Lord, as we move forward in this season, as we move forward in this time, I pray, Lord, that you give us the resolve to actually step out and do the things of your kingdom, Lord. To start in our lives, to start in our homes, to start in our families, Lord. I pray that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us direction, that you would give us knowledge, Lord. I pray for every person here, Lord, that when they go home today, Lord, that, that they would just be so focused on your word, so focused on your truth, Lord. Lord, if there's frustrations, if there's anger, if there's issues over the situations in which they find themselves, Lord, I pray that they would find the spot and the ability to step into your presence, Lord, and, and unload on those, those issues and, and get them off of, of them and, and then allow, posture themselves before you to receive your truth, Lord, to receive your truth. And to allow that truth to become the new standard by which they live, Lord. Lord, I pray for, for just strengthened marriages in this place right now, Lord. Lord, I pray that, Holy Spirit, you would just come into the midst of our relationships with our spouses. And that you would do a mighty work in us, through us. Lord, so that with, in the world that we live, Lord, with marriage being under such a great attack, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would do such a work in our marriages that it would start turning the narrative around. That it would actually start causing people to desire a true, godly marriage because they see how amazing it is. Lord, let, let us stand strong in the midst of these battles, Lord, as you commanded Joshua, Lord, be courageous and be very strong as we are moving into a season. The battle is not over. The battle began 
before the election. And Lord, forgive us for our complacency during Trump's administration. If we got complacent, we got relaxed, and we, we failed to fight the battles, Lord. The Lord renew us with strength and determination to fight the battle that you have put before us. You made us for this moment, Lord. We thank you and we praise you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.